thank you very much. Thank you so much to David and to Philippe. Thank you to Emery. Uh, and uh, give yourselves a hand for sticking it out. <laughs> All right. I'm your designated clown for the evening. <laughs> I have to admit, I feel like a bit of a fraud after all these scholars. I am not a scholar. Uh, I did some graduate work in physics a, a while back. But, uh, but other than that, um, I'm mostly a writer and a performer. Uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My interest in magic began when I was five years old. My father was a scientist, still is. He was a geneticist. And he gave me a magic kit when I was five. And I took to it. I loved performing for him. He really liked it. He never wanted to know how the tricks were done, which I, I thought I thought was kind of cool because his life was devoted to answering questions. Uh, my first gig was my own first, uh, fifth, sorry, rather sixth birthday party. Um, I bombed horribly. Just I was heckled mercilessly. Uh, but I stuck it out. And as embarrassing as it sounds, I became more interested in magic as an adult uh, when I discovered in New York and then internationally this whole subculture of people that do it quite obsessively. And it's a very cool, very vibrant, very strange world with secret societies and competitions. And there's even a magic Olympics that happens every three years, which is just like the regular Olympics, except with magic. And uh, it's, it's, you do a routine in front of judges, and they give you like, <laughs> you know, ratings. And in 2006, I competed, kind of in a fit of hubris, at the uh, Magic Olympics in Stockholm, Sweden, not really knowing the level of competition that was there. Uh, people perform, you know, professional magicians who have been performing their whole lives spend a decade working on one act. And I went there with, you know, a routine I essentially stitched together with like, you know, shoelace and chewing gum in the, mouth bef in the month before. Uh, anyway, there's a, a rule at the Magic Olympics that if you are deemed to be beneath the minimum skill level that all attendees should have, uh, a, a red light of shame is illuminated <laughs> during your act, and you're immediately required to get off stage. Um, that year, uh, that fate befell one uh, magician. Uh, it was a chastening experience, uh, being humiliated in front of about a thousand people, many of them children. Uh, but I didn't give up. Uh, I, my father encouraged me to keep going. And I spent several years after that trying to get better at magic, trying to get good at it trying to become somewhat of a professional. Uh, and in that process, uh, I became very interested in learning about the fundamental aspects of magic, the psychology of it, the history of it, the, the mathematics behind it. My background in science lent itself to that, and I wanted to write about it because it was a world very few people had written about. And what I discovered was that really you do learn a lot about the human mind when you look at why we are fooled and how magicians create these illusions in our head. In fact, I was surprised to discover that a lot of experimental psychology, a lot of cognitive psychology, could be said uh, to be a kind of magic done in a laboratory setting. In fact, even some of the techniques of mu magicians were, were applied in labs, I, I found. And I did some informal experiments of my own. So I'll start off by doing the one thing that magicians aren't supposed to do, and that's by telling you how a trick is done. Uh, this is, I do this not lightly because uh, magicians do take it very seriously. I myself was banned from my local magic society for exposing secrets. Uh, have anyone, has anyone here seen Arrested Development, that show, Job, that is cuttingly close to reality? It's really bad, really true. Um, but anyway, I, I do this not because I'm trying to vandalize the art, but because I actually believe that for good tricks, the secrets almost hold as much interest as the the tricks themselves, and that's because it reveals a very cool idea, something that's sort of blindingly obvious, and yet for some reason we miss it, or some underlying psychological principle. And apologies, by the way, you guys are there are a lot of experts here, so some of this research is probably you know old hat to you. But um, but I'm interested in it because, like I said, I think it says a lot about why we enjoy being fooled and why we enjoy fooling people, and and why this says a lot about who we are and how we perceive daily daily reality. So this is a very simple trick. You've probably seen magicians make coins disappear before, right? Uh, but watch. So I'll, I'll simply, I'll take the coin, place it in my hand, and make it microscopically small until it's gone. So where's the coin right now, right? Well, it's right here, OK? Your stunned silence is worth more to me <laughs> than any standing ovation. 
so I'll, I'll do it one more time. Watch, watch closely. So the coin, the coin goes into the hand like that. Where is it? Right here, right? In this hand, yeah? Uh, I, I simply pretend to put the coin in my hand. And, uh, and then I, I palm it in what's known as classic palm. It's actually pretty hard to do, but not impossible. Um, you have to work the muscles of your hand quite a bit uh, to be able to do it. So I carry around coins like this often, you know, at meals, in the shower. Uh, you want to be able to, you know. But what makes this trick work, what sells it, is actually a cognitive phenomenon. If you, if you watch closely, uh, the brain sees an image of the coin still in the hand for a split second before, after they separate, right? Uh, I think neuroscientists call this a positive after image. Uh, magicians, I like the magician term, they call it getting a good burn. So I think, <laughs> I think that's pretty, pretty cool. Uh, and who, who doesn't do magic to be cool, right? Uh, uh, so watch, look at that. Uh, it's, it's very convincing, even after you know how it's done, you really kind of would wouldn't it uh, kind of feel like it's in there, right? It's really hard, even after you know, and that's the other thing I've learned about magic is even after you know how the tricks are done, in many ways they still fool you because they really exploit these very fundamental mechanisms. And, uh, and this is just one little principle, right? But it's kind of cool. Um, another thing, you know, the body is all electrical impulses, right? And by Faraday's law, electrical impulses, changing electric fields can generate magnetic fields. And if you learn to control those, you can actually create a kind of anti-gravitational pulse. Yeah. It's just science. Uh, so, so that's, I think, persistent vision is sometimes what that's called. I don't know if that's an outdated terminology, but, but that's just one very simple principle. Um, as I continued to investigate this world, I, I learned that, there, that magicians use techniques that basically unlock these little wormholes in the brain. Now, what's the, when you think about magic, what's the thing that magicians use to fool you? What's the main the sort of word that comes to mind when they distract you? Misdirection. misdirection, thank you very much, sir. Uh, misdirection, so what is misdirection? A lot of people think misdirection is, hey, look over here while I do something over here. And that's not untrue, but it's not the basic truth to it. In fact, where you're looking has a lot less to do with whether or not a magician can fool you than what you're attending to. And remarkably, those things are different. You can be looking right at something and not see it. Uh, it was uh, Arian Mack and Irvin Rock who coined the term inattentional blindness. Who here is familiar with that? Yeah, OK, great. <laughs> so inattentional blindness is when we literally are blind to something that we, we actually are looking right at. And it's because our attention is elsewhere. She began doing a lot of studies with faces and dots. And then the sort of most dramatic version ever was that famous gorilla experiment that Daniel Simon did. There was a book by him and Christopher Shabris, The Invisible Gorilla. And you know, the eye tracking devices that they use on those show that people aren't, it's not that they're not looking right at the gorilla. The photons from the gorilla are emptying, empty, entering their eyes and barreling down the optic nerve. It's just that when your attention isn't focused, you miss things that are quite obvious. This is why, for instance, you shouldn't drive while on the cell phone. It's not so much the manual task, it's the cognitive task of, of answering questions and talking. And that's why hands-free devices, uh, jury's still out, but doesn't really seem like they make you significantly or that much safer. Um, Arian Mack and I did a very informal experiment where we brought people into the lab and we distracted them and stole their watches, all right? Uh, I learned how to steal watches from a guy at my magic store, uh, <laughs> who, whose name is Magic, actually. Uh, <laughs> Ed with a K. Um, and, and he's very good at it. There are magicians who've made their living uh, stealing watches and, and doing what's known as uh, theatrical pickpocketing. And, uh, and these guys are, are geniuses at it. And they can steal ties off people and glasses and whatnot. Uh, I'm OK at it. I can steal a watch pretty, pretty well. And we found that, you know, again, this is not the most rigorous scientific study, but we found that you know, most people, 80%, just didn't notice it at all. And I would usually take the watch off and put it on my own wrist as a joke and then say what time it is and ha, 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 ha. And then here's your five bucks. Um, and like, I, again, like it's not the most rigorous study. At least one of them, I think probably the bass player was high. Um, but but I, it, I know magicians anecdotally who've done this hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, and they rarely get caught. And it's, again, because when you distract someone, this is a tactile kind of uh, blindness, right? It's a tactile insensitivity under conditions of misdirection. Uh, but we found that pretty interesting. And um, so... So this exists in many, many forms. Uh, there's also what's known as uh, 
change blindness, right? I'm sure you guys have heard of this too. This is another thing that magicians exploit, and I want to give you an example of something that you can do that's, uh, that's a kind of change blindness. So uh, this, is, this is a very basic trick, but it's, it's quite nice. You can fool your family and friends with it, and that's always the best thing anyway. So I'm going to show you a couple cards here. Let's see. No, not these two. Which one's here? Uh, maybe, uh, yes, these two here. I'll give the deck a shuffle. So change blindness, I'm sure most of you know, but it's the failure to notice changes in consecutive scenes, right? Uh, I have two cards here. Everyone see? Spades and clubs, yeah? I'm going to take these cards, place them in the middle of the deck. Okay, everyone see? Right in the middle. Close it up. Uh, the most dramatic experiment, I think, of, on change blindness was probably done also by Simon. He, he had a, an experimenter stop a pedestrian on the street, right? Asked him for directions, and in the middle of the conversation, someone walked between them with something that obstructed their view, a door, I believe. Then they switched places with one of the researchers, a stooge, and minutes later, seconds later, the pedestrian was talking to a completely different person, and odds are, most people just don't notice this crazy dra dramatic change. Another remarkable incident is, is uh, continuity errors in films. You guys know about this? Uh, you ever, who's here seen Pretty Woman, the movie Pretty Woman? All right, I'm glad that, okay, times have changed, but <laughs> certain, certain priesthoods have remained. That's good. Um, so who was it that, by the way, you made me think of that H.L. Mencken quote, all men are frauds, but the only difference is some of them admit it, speaking of journalism. Uh, so in that movie, I think there's a scene, it's right after Vivian, I don't know, I know her name. Uh, she, I mean, it's Vivian. Uh, she's, right after she spends the night with Richard Gere, she's eating a pancake. She takes a bite, and then the camera cuts away, and it cuts back, and, and then the pancake's turned into her croissant. And, and then it cuts away again, and it's a pancake again, right? Uh, there's another great one in, in The Godfather. Remember that scene where Sonny is at the toll booth, and they, they shoot him? If you look at that, seconds later, the windshield is back to normal. It's restored. Uh, anyway, movies, it's not uncommon, right? Movies are filled with these continuity errors. I just rewatched Reservoir Dogs, and that, movie, that is just loaded with mistakes. It's crazy. Uh, but we don't really care or notice because we're just not paying attention. We're distracted. We're watching other things. Even the people who make the movies don't notice. Um, and this is going on all the time. Uh, for instance, you saw me put the cards in the deck, but look, I just, while you weren't looking, the cards came back. So here they are. Does anyone know? Oh, thank you. Yes, finally. <laughs> Uh, it's not a most sophisticated trick. Who knows how I did it? Yeah, you. They're different suits, yeah. Raise your hand if you notice that. Yeah, not many people notice that, right? And it's not because you're stupid. <laughs> it's, you're all very intelligent people. It's just because the brain doesn't want to notice that, right? I just use different suits. Uh, a lot of people don't like magic because they, it makes them feel stupid. And that's a mistake. In fact, the hardest people to fool are kids, really and truly. Uh, they are the hardest to fool. When, I think it was Alison Gopnik who wrote the book, The Philosophical Baby, she talks about when we say that we're good at paying attention, what we really mean is we're good at not paying attention. Because the ability to ignore peripheral distractions and focus on a lone task is a signal virtue of the human mind. Without it, we'd still be in caves just zoning out, right? We need that. Kids really haven't learned that. Their attention is more scattered. And I think that that's part of the reason why they're so able to figure out tricks because you can't misdirect them as well. They're also shorter, so they see certain things. That might be part of it. That's the trivial, but I think it's more than that. I really do. Experience sort of bears this out. A nine-year-old crowd will just, they'll tear you to pieces. Uh, so, um, so it's not that. It's that we, when we focus on one thing, right, we, we intentionally block other things out, and that's a good thing. But the flip side of that, the flip side of this thing that's necessary for life, just like our, our ability to make patterns and, gener and make stereotypical conclusions in split seconds, is oftentimes an evolutionary drawback to something that we've evolved to need. Or it may be just something that came along for the ride and we don't need it. But in any case, um, I want to give you another example of change blindness. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a slightly less, uh, it might be hard to say, I'm just going to come down. Can everyone still see if I do this? So I just take the ring off, right? I take the ring off like this. Watch, I just put it on really quick like that. Did everyone see that? Did you see that? Do I need to do that again? Watch, the ring comes off like this. Watch, when I put it back on, see? <laughs> Uh, the incredible thing about uh, distractions of this kind is that they also screw with your memory, and magicians exploit false memory 
so much, it's, it's, it's just common practice. Oh, you saw me shuffle the deck, they implant a false statement, they had lied statements, you know, they, they, they confuse you, and then later in retrospect, people misremember it all the time. It actually makes it difficult for magicians sometimes because I'll have people come up to me and say, oh, can you do that trick where, you know, the card explodes? And I'll, they, they will honestly remember a trick in, in incorrectly, and then it makes your job a lot harder. Uh, but as we know, false memory, eyewitness testimony, these kinds of things are so unreliable. And because we don't really know how little we know, we're not aware of the things we aren't aware of, the availability bias, right? We tend to overestimate our powers of observation. So it's, it's kind of crazy to think about what we miss uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I think it was also, uh, there was a study done on, at UT that showed that people are more susceptible to believe lies when they're distracted. There was a study that they did with a mock jury, and they gave them false statements and true statements, and they knew whether the statements were true or false, because I think they were color-coded. But then, when they distracted some of them, they, they were more gullible. So they accepted some of the false statements as true, and they passed harsher sentences in a mock trial. So, uh, so that's interesting, too. Uh, I want to do another thing. I need a volunteer, though. All right, you, please, sir. Come on up. What's your, what's your name? Vlad. Vlad. Vlad, guys. <laughs> so I was inspired by the news because we all know that the media can be, uh, can be, can lie, right? Uh, so I have a, a clipping here. It's from uh, an article from the New York Times, I believe it was yesterday. Russia votes to register news media from outside. See the headline? Okay, good. Now, I made a, you can look at it more closely. Read the headline, yeah. Russia votes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Everyone can see. You can come. You can. I'll, you can inspect it afterwards. Here, I've made a prediction. Wouldn't it be cool, right, if you could predict what the news was going to say? And it, it's written on this piece of paper, and I put it in here for safekeeping. There's nothing else in here. Now, you're going to make a choice. Uh, this is. Uh, we're going. I'm going to talk a little bit about choice blindness next. And this is another remarkable concept, which is that we really do tend to overestimate our own agency and the consequence of our choices in in drastic fashions. Uh, so I want you to, I'm going to ask you to make a choice here. I'm going to just bring the scissors up and down, and you just tell me when to stop wherever you want. Yeah. Right there. Are you sure? Yeah. Do you want me to move? I don't want you to regret it. Don't say, Alex didn't let me do it. He, he was mean. Right here for sure? Okay. Okay. I don't want to touch it. Will you, will you pick it up? So you had a free choice. You could have picked it wherever you want. I want you to read the first se the sentence that you cut to, just the first line, the first first. Mr. Trump nonetheless declared. That Wait, no, no, that's the wrong article. Nope. That's uh, was this article? Okay. That was no. <laughs> <laughs> the United States. Right. This this is a this is about. Yeah, this was about the Twitter or something. No, that's the sorry, but that is the article. Okay. You can confirm it later if you want. Right. The United States accused Russia of meddling. Okay, the United States accused Russia. That's the top line. Now, you could have moved anywhere, right? Let's just, I want you to confirm, because I really, I want you to trust me here. Okay. I want you to confirm, well, we'll do it in a second, but that is the article that, you, that I had. Uh, the United States accused Russia, okay? Now, there's only one thing in here, right? Right. Okay, so let's see what's in here. I don't even remember, I wrote it like two days ago. Let's see, the United States accused Russia. How about that? Thanks, Vlad. No yeah, you can keep that, yeah. Uh, so choice blindness. Uh, I think Vlad, you know, I think we all agree that was a pretty free choice, right? It, it didn't influence him, right? There's a whole literature on, uh, in magic on forcing people to pick a certain thing, a number. I mean, there's books and books and books on this, whether it's a card, a number, even pictures, names, whatever. And... Uh, and a lot of this stuff is, is really uh, backed by science, and a lot of the science is, is essentially using the techniques of magic. Uh, the famous jam study, right, where they had people go into a grocery store and try a sample of jams. I, there's a lot of jam study. Have you noticed that? Like, I think a lot of psychology is funded by big jam. Uh, but there was, this, uh, there was this study, you know, where they had people sample different types of jam, and they said, which one do you like more? And then they gave them the jam. Purportedly, they gave them the jam that they liked, but they switched it. And then they had them try it again, and then most people don't notice it as a different jam. Uh, the most interesting one, I, I think, is the one they did with photographs. And I wonder if, I'm sure you're aware of this, they did this photograph, uh, this experiment where they showed people, there was a pair of photographs, right? And they say, which one do you find more attractive? And you, the subject would say, this one. 
And then they would give them the photograph that they supposedly picked, but they actually they would switch it. And curiously enough, the technique that they used to switch the cards was invented by this magician Hofsenzer, this famous magician, Austrian magician. It was literally a sleight of hand move that they did in the lab, these fancy scientists. <laughs> It was published in Science. It's a legit paper. I'm not faking you. And what is it? Most people didn't even notice that it was a different person that they looked at, which really, uh, you're, what you were saying about how we're not so great at identify facial recognition when it comes to strangers, that really seems to me a corollary or some way related to that. Not only that, though, when asked to justify their choices, people came up with these relatively detailed, relatively specific post hoc explanations for why they made the choice. Oh, I like their chin, they had nice eyes, without even recognizing it. The whole narrative of their choice changed in response to what was essentially a force. So that's, I think, a pretty dramatic thing, and that, like I said, was a technique of magic, and it was, it's something that magicians exploit all the time. And uh, there's hundreds and hundreds of versions. So maybe, just maybe, that trick I showed Vlad was an example of that. Uh, okay, cool. So, I, uh, I, you know, and I, just to emphasize, you know, the, the saying is the hand is quicker than the eye. That's really a, a misnomer it, because the eye is, is blazingly efficient, right? The eye can pick up motion that's a millisecond in length. Five photons, quanta of light, are enough to trigger a visual response. It's not the eye, it's the brain that's really lagging behind here. So the, a better saying might be that the hand is quicker than the mind, right? Because these are cognitive illusions not illusions of the eye, but illusions of the mind. Uh, any questions? I, I know uh, just, I've said a lot, or maybe not that much. <laughs> so the next thing I'd like to talk about are, sc are scams. So, oh yeah, go ahead. Um, a, um, did you study optics at all, and would you recommend that uh, a magician prepare for? It's a really cool uh, question. Uh, by studying optics. So a lot of stage illusions yeah, a lot of stage illusions, especially in the past, were fairly sophisticated optical devices, mirrors at angles, less so with, uh, with close-up magic, which is what I tend to do, stage uh, not stage magic. Uh, but it, it's, uh, I actually think it's more interesting or important to study the psychology than the optics. It certainly matters, right? Lines of sight and things like that are, are crucial. Uh, so, yeah, sure. So another thing I, I'm, I'm very interested in is we talk about lying, right? So mag magic is a kind of lying for fun. Right? It's deception. It's meant to entertain. But the same techniques of magic are, are, many of the techniques of magic are borrowed from the criminal underworld, right? Scams and cons. How many people here are familiar with like, the three-card Monty or the shell game, right? The three-card Monty. So I'll have a version that I'd like to show you for those who have and haven't seen it. And it uses, for those of you who might not know, it uses three cards, okay? An ace a two, and a three. And the ace is what's called the money card. Right? The money card is the card you have to keep your eye on. So if you, if you pick the money card, you win. If you don't, you lose. And you see this game still on the streets of New York. It's amazing. And I spent a lot of time with the Monty guys casing them out. And I've seen people lose hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars at this game. It's becoming less common in the States. You still see it in Europe, actually, uh, more. I see it in Barcelona, where my dad lives. Anyway, the idea is, Oh, and they're big cards, so I can't, you know, hide them in my hands. So the idea is you take the cards and you mix them up a little bit. Okay. So, again, it's the ace that you have to keep track of. That's the money card. So I'll put it in my pants for safekeeping. Do you guys see where the ace went? Right here, right? <laughs> it's a little hard to follow, so let me do it again. Remember, it's the ace you want to keep track of. The thing is... It's hard when I mix them up, and they all look the same. They're all the same size. So what I'll do to make it a little easier is I'll just stick the ace up just a little bit, okay? Just a little bit more, just to help you out. So there you can see the ace is different from the other three, right? And then I'll take the ace, and I'll put it in my pants, again, for safekeeping. Do you guys see me put the ace here? Oh, I really did. <laughs> <laughs> the pants. Uh, the thing is, it's very hard to win at this game. And the reason is because I'm using three cards, and sometimes I'll pretend to take one card, but I'll actually take two. So it's very hard to spot, very hard to win your money back after you've lost it. So to make it easier, I'm going to make it 
instead of the three card Monty, I'm going to make it the two card Monty. That way you legitimately have an ace and a three and that's all you have to follow. Okay? Now watch closely. You guys see where I put the ace? It was here all along. <laughs> So I was really interested in the three card Monty because it's this rudimentary scam, but in it you really see the, the skeleton of, of con art that, that applies, I feel like it's the same psychology that applies to, you know, whether it's like a billion dollar Ponzi scheme or, or selling wars to Congress or, I mean look, Trump, if he's one thing, he's a good con artist, right? He really is. He's a, I can't believe I'm saying this, but he's a brilliant con artist. He really is. And, uh, and uh, he, because he created false confidence in people, right? He convinces people that something that's too good to be true is true, and they believe it. And uh, the three card Monty, a lot of people don't know it, but it has this really kind of rich history in America. It, it was in the 1850s, it was one of the first sort of criminal enterprises, some of the first criminal enterprises, the, the forerunners of the mob were really based on, funded by the three card Monty. Guys made what today would be, you know, 20, 25 million dollars playing the Monty on the river boats. Uh, actually, my favorite story is about this guy, Benjamin Marks, who was a Civil War courier. And in, I think it was 1867, he went up to Wyoming to try to hustle people and found out it was kind of glutted. So he opened up a store, he decided, a storefront. He put in all these very luxurious looking items in the window. And he called it the dollar store. People would come in, lured by these offers, priced at you know, really ridiculous discounts. And then when they came into the store, he would sh you know, shoulder them to the back. Or, and there, there was a Monty game played over a wooden barrel, and they would lose all their money, so they'd never buy anything, right? Uh, and then eventually, I guess, someone realized that they could make just as much money selling really cheap garbage items for low prices, and so they went legit. And that's where we, those are the sort of ancestors of the modern dollar store, right? This great evolution in price point retail. Um, now as ever, you get nothing for nothing, and sometimes even less. Uh, so I like the Monty because I, it's more than just, speaking of theater, it is a form of theater. So the typical Monty scam, I don't know if you've seen it, if you've seen it on the streets, it's never just one person like I did. It's a, a group of about eight people, it, the typical Monty mob. Two of them will watch for the cops, those are the wingmen. And then the rest uh, are the shills, right? The shills play a very specific, each one plays a very specific part. So there's an operator who mixes the card, right? Oftentimes the operator will pretend to be blind or drunk. And then there's the shill that wins, right? wins because you, the mark, the sucker, wants to see that you can win. But then there's always another shield that loses, but loses in a dumb way, right? Picks the obviously wrong card. So then the sucker, the mark, thinks, ah, oh, I can do better than that. But it doesn't stop at that. Then one of the shields will cheat. So the operator will turn his head, maybe because they think of this cop, or maybe he'll drop a card. And then the cheater will take the, one of the cards, turn over the money card, reveal it to everyone. And, some, and, and then he'll win. Right? And then the mark is thinking, oh my goodness, this is no honor among thieves. This is totally a scam, right? And he's seeing how the game is played. He's seeing all the strings. He thinks he has an inside look, right? Then the cheater will try to cheat again. The operator will turn away. The cheater will cheat, but the operator will see him out of the corner of his eye. Then the cheater will look away, and the operator will switch the cards, and the cheater will lose. So now the mark is seeing this, and he's thinking, holy cow. And also at some point, the cheater might, you know, someone will off, say, oh, I, he won't let me bet because I'm winning. So he'll, he'll say, you know, bet for me. He'll give the operator money. So the guy has the feel of money in his hands. And by the end of it, and this is crucial, it's not that the operator doesn't know it's a scam, right? In fact, it depends on, uh, or the sucker rather, it depends on the sucker thinking it's a scam and then thinking he can write himself into it, right? It attracts, it targets this kernel of avarice and greed that is in all of us, right? That wants to believe that something that is too good to be true, right? I'm not going to lie, I've fallen for it too. You can't win, by the way. Even if you, it's impossible. Don't ever try. You will lose, 100%. The odds are not one in three. <laughs> they are zero. <laughs> they are zero. Uh, but I love, I love the game in a way, and I do kind of have a respect for it. Because, you know, con artists, there's a reason why they're the only criminals we call artists, right, in a way. Uh, that, that takes a certain deft touch to be able to scam someone out of hundreds of dollars and then get them to walk away without calling the cops, right? Cutting someone's purse or mugging them is not, not quite so elegant. 
Not that I'm trying, not trying to heroize these people, but you know, it is kind of an art. And I do think the psychology to it is really un underlies a lot of cons, and it's because we want to believe. Uh, so speaking of wanting to believe, uh, I'd like to sort of end on uh, another kind of con, another kind of using magic to deceive, and that's uh, what's known as mentalism. How many people have heard of mentalism? Yeah, okay. So mentalism is a form of magic that involves mind reading, spoon bending, psychics. And again, there's a really cool literature that kind of backs it up. It goes back to this uh, psychologist, I believe from the 50s, Bertram Four. You guys heard of him? He did this experiment with his students, I think, where he had them fill out a personality assessment test called the Diagnostic Interest Blank. And it was a series of personality questions. And then he gave them, afterwards, a uh, personality assessment based on, or ostensibly based on, the results of this test, and asked the students to rank the accuracy of the personality descriptions, you know, from one to five. One meaning, no, not me at all. Five meaning, you nailed it, that's exactly who I am. So he did this, and the results were about 4.2. And that seems to suggest that the, it was a very accurate, precise instrument. Of course, he never used it, right? He chunked the diagnostic interest test in the blank, in the, in the, in the trash, and just gave everyone identical readings from an astrology magazine he got off a newsstand. And this has been uh, termed the Barnum effect for, uh, for P.T. Barnum, who said there's something for everyone. Uh, not there's a sucker born every minute, though that wouldn't be, that would be apt, I suppose, as well. Uh, they've done this experiment uh, many times, and the results are always fairly high. People want to believe that the, these descriptions are ac accurate, and this is obviously the psychology that underlines horoscopes. Uh, for anyone who believes in horoscopes, I'm sorry, <laughs> but that's <laughs> I, I, my my fiance. Oh, don't you? She's we probably if, if there's one thing that threatens our marriage, it's it's that she likes astrology. Um, it's a benign fantasy. Let's just say that. Uh, but it's, um, no. Well, so they, they did a corollary to this experiment. They did one where they brought in a, an astrologer. They divided people up into three groups, and they had one group give the astrologer their exact birthday, a month, day, year. Another group just gave the month and year of their birth, and then a third group gave no information. Gave everyone identical readings and had them rank the accuracy. So results were that the, the people who had given no information ranked it in the mid-3.5, 3, 3 around there. People who had given the month and date, uh, sorry, the month and year of their birth ranked it a little higher, 3.8 or so. But then the people who had given their exact birth date ranked it around a 4.2, 4.3, which is quite, kind of remarkable, right? Because it means that the perceived accuracy of the reading was not a function of what the astrologer, what the psychic told them, but what they told the astrologer. So uh, this is a principle that people have been using to scam people for a long time, right? It's the basis of a billion dollar industry horoscopes, psychics, and a lot of magicians who have turned to mentalism and are using it sometimes under some wishy-washy guise of a psychological mind-reading entertainment, but really it's just tricks. It's really just tricks. I'm going to give you a, another example of predicting the future. Uh, could I have another volunteer? Yeah, you, come up, sir. What's your name? Uh, my name's Naeem. Naeem. Everyone, Naeem. Naeem, I have a, do you play cards at all? Uh, not much. Okay, well, I have made a prediction. I have a deck of cards here. You can see it's shuffled. And inside this envelope, I have one card. And that card is a prediction. All right, we'll get to that in a minute. So what I want you to do, I'm going to have you pick a card, all right? And I want you to take the cards and, uh, and just hold them in your hand. Like, yeah, like that. You play, yeah, good, that's perfect. And what I want you to do, that, I want you to deal the cards face up in my hand. Just deal them face up in my hand. Yep. And you can stop whenever you want. Look at me. I want you to, yeah. No, no, you don't have to look at me. <laughs> and every time, anytime you want, you can stop. All right? He's messing with me, isn't he? <laughs> that, you're 100% you're sure? Yes, sir. You don't have to call me sir. I'm not a professor. <laughs> okay. You're 100% sure this is where he wants to stop. What card did you stop at? Nine of hearts. Nine of hearts, okay. You could have stopped at the ace of hearts. You could have stopped at the uh, three of hearts, three of spades, king of clubs, two of hearts. You could have stopped at a lot of different cards, okay? All right. All right? Fair enough? Now, I made a prediction, okay? Yes. Good. He's one? been following. Is that one card? 
Yes, I'm going to show you in a minute. Thank you for asking that, though. Thank you for keeping me honest. All right. It's hard to get it open sometimes. How many cards do you see in there? Uh, one card. One card. Yes. Thank you. I mean. Get out of here. Uh, so, um, so mentalism is, is interesting, right? Predicting the future, talking to dead people. Houdini actually first, when he, before, he, before he became famous, he, he, was a, he would go to towns and pretend that he could commune with the dead. He would go to graveyards, he would ask about the recently deceased. And then he felt very bad about it later in his life and he spent about a decade or so railing against spiritualists. That was a huge movement back then. And, uh, but he still held out a, a belief in it, or at least a hope, because uh, when he died, he told his wife to have a seance every year, and, he, and they had like a code word. You know? And today, to, the Houdini seance has now become kind of a tradition among magicians that they, that they still have. Uh, but mentalism really does, we want to believe, unlike magic, where it's like an obvious trick, this kind of magic, and it is magic, uh, it's really more, it's, it's not so much about being fooled, it's about being understood, right? And, and it's a very powerful thing if you ever experienced it. People want to believe that there's something out there. People want to believe that they're understood, that they're not alone. I've done these kinds of mind reading tricks on people, explained to them how it, it works, everything. Cold reading, which is where you use a combination of sleight of hand and sort of basic general statements and sort of reading their facial expressions. And they, even after you explain to them how it's done, they still they don't believe you. They, they, they want to believe, and, and that's a very powerful thing. And I'm not trying to belittle people who believe in that because it, we all, I think, have that. I think it's a pretty basic, you know, powerful thing. And, and religions, I would say, have been sort of used this principle. Uh, ancient priests uh, used to use, you know, uh, steam to raise the, raise the doors on temples, right? Uh, there's even this uh, fascinating uh, book by Morton Smith, who was one of the great post-World War II uh, biblical scholars, called Jesus the Magician, where he argues that, that Jesus uh, may have been an illusionist, that the, the miracles described in the Gospels, water into wine, levitations, things like that, are pretty close to stage illusions. There's a lot of very strong parallels between the magical papyra in Egypt and the Gospels, some uh, speculation that maybe Jesus spent that time, uh, those 18 years that aren't accounted for in the Gospels, learning from the magic men, uh, and perhaps, um, you know, I don't know, something to think about. I'm not saying anything crazy. I'm just, just it's interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, Mormonism too, actually. Joseph Smith used to claim that he could, he was a dowser, that he could find water. Like Uri Geller said, you know, um, Uri Geller, how many people know about him? Spoonbender? There's another thing, if you, if you want to start a religion. Uh, here, uh, this, is, uh, this is pretty compelling. Here, uh, I'm going to show you. Those look like normal spoons. Yeah, yeah, solid, yeah. They're actually from the dollar store. But, uh, but they'll, they'll, they'll work. Uh, which one would pick one? This one. Okay, that's going to be the control. There are scientists here. All right, watch. Here you see. I want you to watch very closely. Look, the eyes don't lie, right? I'm just going to bend it with my mind. Let me see. Did it work? Yeah. That's weird, right? Here, keep holding it. See if we can do it a little bit more. See if we can do it a little bit more. It's starting to balance a little bit. Watch right here. Wow. I'm getting a little lightheaded. <laughs> takes a lot of exertion. All right. So some people think, oh, you have really strong hands, and that's what I'm doing. So watch, I'm not even going to touch the, the watch, watch right here, okay, everyone? Watch the bell or the spoon. Thank you. Of course, on illusion, spoons were never actually bent. <laughs> 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 
That's exactly right. The amazing Randy, brilliant magician, skeptic, founder of, uh, of the Randy Institute and the challenge. He challenged, uh, he's challenged Yuri Geller. These, like, Yuri Geller and him are like arch enemies. Uh, but they've challenged each other to, or he's challenged Geller or anyone really to, to demonstrate, you know, psychic abilities under controlled test conditions. And no one's won the prize yet. But, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. So that's, that's, sorry, did someone else have something? Okay, cool. Can you shoot it again? Oh, yeah, no, they were never bent. <laughs> oh, gosh, no. Gosh, it's an old, old, there's, first of all, there's many, many, many methods. Spoons, forks, keys. There's, it's a, there's a whole literature on it called PK. Oh, I mean, you, there are magicians who just do that. So when did he become so famous? Uh, he was very sort of charismatic. Very good at self-promotion. Very good at suing people. <laughs> very litigious. Uh, and he just um, he marketed himself. And he did it with abandon. You know, like he just didn't, no provisos, just this is what I do. And, uh, you know, he's not the only one. But uh, actually one of Randy's disciples, Ben Achek, who's actually a really good guy, he fooled scientists using this. And there were these famous, the Alpha, Pro the Alpha Project, I think it was called, where they, they let under... It's crazy. Uh, it's, people want to believe this stuff. It's very powerful. Uh, but I don't want to end on a negative note uh, because magic ultimately I think is wonderful and I think it's wonderful because it's a controlled way of experiencing a loss of control. It's lying for fun. It's lying for entertainment. And it's also, well, it's fun to fool people. Uh, it was, it's Ekman, right? Paul Ekman who talked about duping delight, the pleasure that we get from putting something over on someone. I mean, let's all admit it, right? Who hasn't maybe fibbed a little bit and got away with it and thought, okay. <laughs> right? Uh, it doesn't have to be malicious, but uh, according to Ekman, the size of the lie, the difficulty of fooling the target, and the respect that we earn from it are all factors that go into how much we enjoy this act of deception. And uh, magicians have made this into a kind of gladiatorial enterprise with these tournaments, right? The Magic Olympics uh, is, and, and that's just one of many international tournaments, national tournaments, where they get together, they do these elaborate, breathtakingly difficult tricks for the most discerning audience possible, all expert magicians. And if they win, they get, you know, prizes and stuff and the respect of their peers more than anything. Like Gottnick said, it's not even about money. And many of these competitions have very little in terms of prizes, it's about winning respect. And this drives a lot of innovation in magic. Uh, all right, I need a, one, someone else to pick a card here. Uh, who, who wants to do that? Yeah, you please. Here, what's your name? Sarah. Sarah. Uh, yeah, Sarah. I love magic. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, here, Sarah, take any card. That one? Yep. Is it the Ace of Hearts? Yeah. Oh, geez. Give me that back. Here. Oh, I know that one. <laughs> take, take a different card. Take a different one. That one? That one? Okay, good. All right. Uh, actually, this one is even, it's not even a find your card trick. I, I can see it. I just want you to put your signature, big letters, on the, on the back, of, on the front of the card, rather. Big letters, big, big letters. Okay. All right, perfect. Actually, yeah, I'm going to show it to everyone. That's okay. Uh, Ace of diamonds. Okay, good choice. And that's your, wow, are you a doctor? That's, <laughs> all right. So, so I would argue that it's, it's fun to fool people, and it's also fun to be fooled, right? Because it's, it's a cathartic experience. Um, I took a, a class on clowning once, which was, turned out to be a stage clown. It was really beautiful uh, sort of lyrical uh, theories about clowning. He said clowns are the, the physical manifestation of the unsocialized self. And I think you could say that, that magic is the sort of physical manifestation of the dream self. And uh, so it's a kind of wish fulfillment. There's a kind of metaphorical aspect to it. In magic, if you cut something, you have to restore it, right? Otherwise, it creates angst because it's a metaphor for death, right? Or if you make something disappear, you got to bring it back. Or if you change money into other kinds of money, you kind of want to go from like a, a one to a hundred, not the other way around. Um, so I, 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 I don't know if you saw, I took her card, I put it in the middle of the deck, right? It's not on the top, not on the bottom, okay? This is a trick that is famous because it fooled Houdini, all right? This is called the ambitious card. And Houdini had this boast. He said that, and this is the height of his career, he said that no magician could fool him with a trick if he saw it performed three times, right? How many people have heard that you're not supposed to repeat a trick for the same audience, right? Once is a trick, twice is a lesson, that's kind of the motto. 
So he did this trick, and in the trick, a sign card is placed in the middle of the deck, a magical gesture is affected, and the card somehow rises to the top. Does everyone see that? Because right. you didn't ask, I'll do it again. The card, the ace of diamonds that you signed, goes into the middle. I'll put it a little bit closer to the bottom, just like that. Okay, it has a little bit farther to travel. Everyone see? If you're familiar with quantum physics, this is a, this is a tunneling phenomenon, right? In the classical, in the, in the classical regime, a particle confined to a, a potential well cannot escape, right? But in the quantum regime, it's absolutely possible. There's a finite, non-zero probability that a particle could tunnel through a barrier. You have to perturb it a little bit, like that, you see? So, for years, Houdini's boast went unmet, unchallenged. And then, one day, a relatively unknown card magician by the name of Di Vernon, uh, who was Canadian, a lot of Canadians here, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, uh, he performed a version of this trick for Houdini. And uh, here, this time I'll let, you, I'll let you push the card in. That's the ace. Yeah, you push it. Yeah, push it in. No, oh, oh, here. Push it in all the way. He performed a version of this trick eight times before Houdini finally walked out in defeat. And, uh, and since then, Di Vernon was known as the man who fooled Houdini. And he was really like the, the Albert Einstein of sleight of hand magic. He revolutionized sleight of hand. He really was the one who kind of took magic from being a bit more showy and, and sort of about braggery and showing off talent to really never seeing the method, simplicity and elegance. The card's never on the top of the deck, right? What happens is whatever card happens to be on the top automatically changes into the other card when I do it. That's what actually is going on, just so you know. Um, also quantum, particles can <laughs> decay. And other, right, meta metaphor's gone far enough, right? Um, Sometimes what hustlers will do is they'll put a crimp in a card, a bend in a card, so you can identify it from the, see, from the back as well as the front. But this will enable you to see the exact moment when the card rises to the top. Watch very, clear, very closely. Ready? On the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> yeah. So Di Vernon uh, went on to become this great sort of king of sleight of hand magic. He lived to a very uh, advanced age, 92, 93, and uh, was very successful, respected by all his peers, had fooled them all. And he was asked right before his death by Dick Cavett, the talk show host and uh, also a, an avid magician. Uh, before he died, he asked him, what, uh, what do you wish for? You've had this amazing life. You've been successful. You're admired by your peers. Before you die, is there anything that you still wish for? And Di Vernon uh, responded in sort of pithy, elegant fashion, much like his magic. He said, I wish someone could fool me one more time. Thank you. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Could you do that? Uh, <laughs> the spoon thing again, late at dinner. I'll show you at dinner. <laughs> go ahead, yes, yeah, sorry. You look, are there, you look are there any subsets of people with pathological cognition that are less susceptible to magic tricks? For instance, autistics or schizophrenics? And has any work been done studying them to understand? That's a really good question, and I've asked that myself. And as far as I know, no. Yeah, I've thought that we've actually, and I, uh, it's, a, it's a great idea, but I don't know. I, I haven't found any. Okay. I haven't found any. Yeah. Yes, please. Would you do some of your uh, card tricks if I gave you a, a new intact? Oh, of course, card? yeah. yeah. So yeah I only, it doesn't have to be your... No, no, no I, but I wouldn't be very... I mean, there are certainly, uh, you can buy hundreds of trick decks. There's every kind of trick deck. They're sort of frowned upon in a way uh, because... I like to do a trick where if you found out how I did it, you like wouldn't lose respect for me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, the, certainly, yeah, certainly. 
Anyone else? Thank you very much.